is up, my friends and fellow busy bees. Now, I've been teasing this episode for a while, and it is finally here. I am back today with another installment in the 101 series, highlighting the basics of furniture refinishing, and today we're doing an overview all about furniture strippers. As always, before we get into the episode, a disclaimer that I encourage you to use these episodes as a starting off point for your own research on what products you prefer, the health and safety implications to be aware of based on the products that you use, and all that other liability related stuff. I'm sharing my experience and the knowledge that I have, so let it be a jumping off point for you, but don't take it as the be all end all. Got it? Okay, cool. Now let's jump into it. So if you listen to episode 44, five methods to remove the finish off your furniture, then you know that specifically using a paint stripper isn't one of the methods that I gravitate towards all that much these days. However, it is definitely some people's go-to and I do think that it has a time and a place for certain projects, even for me. In fact, this past week I went hard in the stripper on a little desk I saved on garbage day and my god did it help give the piece a total glow up. So in today's episode, I'm going to talk about all the different furniture strippers that there are, the different types, and the advantages and disadvantages of each, things to consider when choosing which stripper to use, some popular brands and the ones that I usually gravitate towards, how to use it and my tips for doing so, and finally, some common mistakes to avoid when using a furniture stripper. So furniture strippers are products that are designed to remove the finish or paint from a piece of furniture, which allows you to start your furniture makeover from a clean base to work off of. Even if you intend on painting the piece you're working on, stripping the existing finish down or off completely will make all the difference in achieving a flawless finish because any bunches, bumps, nicks, or grime will get removed in the stripping process, so that won't be sitting beneath the finish that you opt for in your furniture flip. So I kept today's episode high level to discuss furniture strippers as a whole, and those fall within two main categories, mechanical strippers and chemical strippers. We'll start with mechanical strippers, which you likely already know and use, but just don't necessarily refer to them as such. Mechanical strippers use a physical method, such as sanding or scraping, to remove the existing finish or paint on a piece of furniture. Since this typically involves using a tool of some sort, this can be a more economical option in the long term if you plan on doing more than just one furniture makeover, because you can buy the tool, whether it be a carbide scraper or an electrical sander, and although you have that upfront cost that may be higher than purchasing a chemical stripper, you can get way more uses out of that tool in the long term versus having to continually buy more of the chemical stripper product. Assuming that you're taking the proper precautions to protect yourself, the mechanical strippers are typically considered to be safer to work with because your risk of exposure to chemicals just isn't there. And if you don't know what you should be wearing to keep yourself safe, make sure you pop over and listen to episode 47 after this, which is called Safety Equipment and Safety Gear to Wear When Painting and Refinishing Furniture. Lots of helpful tips there. One disadvantage of choosing mechanical strippers over chemical ones is that it is typically more labor intensive. Even if you're using an electrical tool, chances are you're gonna be harder on your back as you wait for the piece to be sanded or scraped compared to letting a chemical just do the job and then wiping that finish away. This is especially true when you're trying to get through a piece of Frankenstein furniture that has layers and layers and layers of paint or other finish caked up from multiple refinishing jobs over the years and you're trying to work through that like that little desk that I mentioned earlier. Thick, thick primer and then plenty of latex paint, not really applied in the most delicate of ways. That is a surefire way to gum up your sandpaper pads in an icky, sticky way, so keep that in mind. Using a mechanical stripper can also be less effective if you're working on pieces that don't have a lot of flat edges and are either smaller and tight to reach or are maybe just more ornate and have many ridges, curves, and contours that are hard to get those tools into. A risk that may be present when you go to use a mechanical stripper, especially if you're new to using these tools and products, is scratching up the surface of your furniture piece. If you aren't careful, you could damage the material underneath the finish if you're sanding or scraping the piece too hard or too long or potentially in the wrong direction. 
I've talked before about how when I first started out doing furniture makeovers, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to be pushing down when using an electric sander, and I also wasn't switching out my sanding discs often enough. So essentially I was making marks in the wood beneath the finish and would then either blow through the veneer if that was what was on the piece or would leave those little swirl markings in the wood from pushing down on the orbital sander or leaving it in one spot for too long. Lessons that sometimes you just need to learn the hard way, but lucky for you, you're here to learn from mine. The other category of furniture strippers are chemical strippers. These work by dissolving the existing finish or paint on the piece, using chemicals in the formula of the product that you apply, which makes it easy to wipe or scrape the finish away after the product has sat long enough to eat through it. This is probably what most often comes to mind when you think of a furniture stripper, so I'm going to mainly focus on this category for this episode, but I thought it was worth noting the mechanical stripper aspect as well, since it's likely the approach that you're more commonly taking on your furniture makeovers. When it comes to chemical strippers, I find it to be most effective to choose over other alternatives when you're working on a piece that needs multiple layers of paint or finish removed from it. The pieces that you find that on are typically older and more vintage or antique pieces, just because they've been around for so long and have had multiple lives that they've lived with different makeovers. But that wood is often also obviously much older, and therefore it can be more dry or brittle and easier to crack, flake, or just become damaged in some other way. This means that using a chemical stripper in these instances also probably makes the most sense so that you avoid adding unnecessary additional impact to those older, more fragile pieces. You'll know them when you encounter them. And choosing the chemical stripper option typically means assuming that the stripper did its job correctly, which I have seen it not do at times, so take that for what it's worth but it typically means that the job will be less labor intensive. In theory, the finish should be all bubbled up or separated from the furniture piece essentially, and it's just a matter of scraping it up, which added bonus is so satisfying and gives total ASMR vibes. There's rarely a time when I won't film myself scraping up paint strippers so that I can later look back on the time lapse and just feel that satisfaction again. It looks so like so satisfying to see it get scraped up that quickly. I don't know. And I usually post it for you guys so that you can also enjoy it, of course, on my social media. And if you're someone who really loves hearing about these helpful hacks and creative tips for your furniture flips, as well as loves seeing pretty painted pieces and rad refinished relics, I highly recommend that you sign up for my Friday Furniture Focus newsletter. I send it out every week and it's jam-packed with furniture facts, furniture fixes, I share whose pieces I'm furniture fangirling over, introduce you to furniture friends and artists and their businesses so that you can get to know more about them and their work, and and so much more. So if you'd like to sign up, you can click the link in the show notes or head to meldiditherself.ca and keep an eye on your inbox because all that great stuff is coming your way. And then one negative of chemical strippers is that they are definitely more harsh and can be dangerous to work with, particularly if you aren't wearing the proper safety gear and working in the ideal setting or environment. That means proper ventilation, preferably with open doors or windows to allow the fresh air in. You also want to be wearing a respirator so that regardless of the ventilation, you aren't inhaling the chemical fumes that can be damaging to your lungs and other organs. There are definitely less harsh options being created of chemical strippers as time goes on due to the increase in demand for more eco-friendly strippers and a focus on sustainability. According to a report by Allied Market Research, the global eco-friendly furniture market is projected to reach $8.08 billion, billion with a B, by 2027, which is growing at a compound annual growth rate of 6.3% from 2020 to 2027. So that means more consumers, more demand, more requests, and thus more supply made to meet said demand. And if you're interested in learning more about the chemicals and hazards of paint strippers, one creator I highly recommend you go follow is Amy from OAC Upcycle. I'll link her account in the show notes. 
She is a sustainability consultant by day, and so she lives and breathes this stuff. And she shares so many helpful resources about what you should be reading in the labels of these products and what that means relative to other chemicals and hazards that exist. She also shares about safety data sheets, which you can find for any product that you get, and it will outline things like the ways that you can properly protect yourself from said product. And overall, she's just a rad furniture finisher with such a bright personality and a couple cute doggos, not to mention some gorgeous painted and refinished pieces. So go check her out and learn something new if you haven't already. And if you guys would be interested in her coming onto the podcast in the future to talk more about the details as it relates to this stuff, let me know because I think she would be an awesome expert to have on and to be able to talk from a much more informed position than I am about these types of things. So give me a shout if that interests you. When it comes to chemical strippers, there's also the cost factor. Per use, chemical strippers are definitely more costly. If I'm working on a decent sized piece and need to strip the whole thing, I'm usually going through pretty much a full container of the product, which ranges in price, but it's never less than like $15. Whereas, for example, my carbide scraper that I use as a mechanical stripper only costs me about $35, and I've probably already used that to strip well over 20 pieces of furniture, and she's still good as new. She's going strong. She's going to be around for a while. With the chemical strippers, you're typically paying a higher ticket for the set it and forget it convenience of it, which fair enough. That may be totally worth it cost-wise for you, depending on what your time and effort costs you. Chemical strippers may also benefit you if you are working on pieces that have a lot of details or are more ornate and thus are harder to get a sander or a scraper into those little spots. Instead, allowing a chemical to lift up that finish and then scrubbing it away with an old toothbrush or another hard bristle brush may honestly save you hours compared to trying to hand sand those details. Take it from me because I have absolutely hand sanded pieces before out of stupidity of not thinking it through and realizing I should just grab a paint stripper and I have totally regretted it. That piece ended up being one of the ones that sat at the back of the garage, 35% completed for like seven months before I forced myself to start back up on it and just get it done and out of there. If you know, you know. In terms of choosing which category of furniture stripper to choose and which product, there's a few things that you can take into consideration based on the project that you're doing. First off, what type of finish are you trying to remove? That can help to narrow your focus. Like I said, if I know I want to get rid of a latex paint, I almost always grab for a chemical paint stripper. Again, you're also going to want to consider what type of wood or material is underneath the finish that you're stripping off. Older woods that may be more brittle might be a good indication to reach for a more gentle chemical stripper, depending on the piece. Sometimes with certain old glossy finishes, I can just tell that a scraper would eat through the majority of the work in no time, and so it's a no-brainer. So take a peek at what's underneath before you commit to one method or the other. You may also want to consider how new or experienced you are with the different techniques and your level of mobility or if you require certain accommodations due to injury or other issues. You may also have a preference of method to choose regardless of the pieces that you're working on due to wanting to stick to natural or eco-friendly strippers. While others, on the other hand, may prioritize speed and effectiveness and the ingredients in the product aren't as big of a priority to them, no way is better or worse. It's totally up to you, personal preference. However, whichever method you opt for, do make sure to read up on what the requirements are for that product to keep yourself safe and protected, especially in the long term when you're using these products and tools. There are a ton of options out there when it comes to chemical strippers, and depending what country you're in, the selection may vary, but I'll discuss a couple options that are available in Canada and in the US, I believe. So the one I typically grab for is Easy Strip, E-Z-E-Z Strip. I get it from Home Depot and I used it once and it did the job decently and so I just keep grabbing for it. Uh, What I do like about it is that the consistency is somewhere between a liquid and a gel so that it's really easy to spread across your surface. However, it doesn't immediately run off the sides and get your space all dirty and frigged up. Another popular product is Citrus Strip. 
I see a lot of people using it, and when I used it, I personally wasn't super impressed with the results that I had gotten. However, I will say that it was earlier on in my furniture refinishing journey, so I may not have been doing the method that I do now to apply it, and so that could have contributed to the results that I got. So it might be worth trying it out for yourself if you've been wanting to. Like I said, my opinion isn't the be-all end-all. I do recall that the smell wasn't as harsh and chemically compared to some other products, hence the name. It has a citrus scent. And I do believe it was more expensive than the one that I use now, but it was more of like a gel consistency, so it has that going for it, which is nice. Shout out to you if you know the meme. Another popular brand I see furniture refinishers using is Clean Strip, clean with a K. However, this is one of the options that is a methylene chloride-based stripper, which is a much more harsh chemical than the first two options mentioned. Due to this, it is said to be better for tougher jobs and gets the job done quickly and easily. Since it is one of those heavier duty strippers, proper safety precautions are imperative more than ever. I do believe I have used this stripper in the past, and if I recall correctly, it worked well, but it was a super strong scent that lasted in the workshop well after I was done using it, and it was a liquid, so I find that just a little bit more difficult to keep tidy and work with based on the method that I use for chemical strippers, so that's why I never reached for it again. Now, what is that method, you may ask? It's definitely not rocket science applying a chemical stripper. You just apply it to your piece and let it sit, essentially. I do one side of the piece at a time so that the product can stay on it easier instead of having some sides be like upright and vertical and trying to race to get it on and keep it there. I recommend applying more product than you think you'll need and I typically apply it with either a foam brush or if I have a super cheap chip brush that I don't mind throwing out afterwards. Sometimes if I have a roller on its like last legs I'll use that too before tossing it. Then I find the key to actually getting the stripper to really work well, particularly if you aren't using one of the super heavy duty strippers with the harsh chemicals, is to lay some saran wrap or plastic wrap over the section that you put the stripper on. This creates a protective layer between the product and the air so that it doesn't dry out as quickly and I find it really presses the product into the furniture so that you don't have to put as much elbow grease into it when you go to scrape it all away. I also typically leave the product on for longer than the directions indicate when using the less intense strippers. So when it says to leave it for 15 to 45 minutes, I'll typically leave it for an hour, an hour and a half. I find that's the sweet spot where it lifts up just a little bit more of the finish, but due to the plastic wrap, it isn't drying up yet and making your life twice as hard having to scrape away the sticky dried up stripper plus the hardened plastic wrap now glued to it. Then when I go to remove the stripper and finish beneath it, I use a scraper to remove everything, usually a metal one because if it's a plastic one, the chemicals may eat away at it over time. But do use caution if you're using a metal scraper that you're staying parallel to the furniture and not gouging the material you're stripping as you scrape the finish away. Then I essentially uncover only a little bit at a time so that the plastic wrap is staying over it for as long as possible. I'll push one section back to the end of that portion of the piece and then do the same on the sections beside it until all the gunk is sitting at the end of that portion of the piece and then scoop it up all together and dispose of it. Another thing worth noting is, as I always recommend, to read the directions of the product that you're using to find out the proper disposal instructions because there's likely something specific written down due to them being such intense chemicals. Many of these products are flammable, so it's really important to look into it and you can check with your local waste management facility to find out their guidelines for its proper disposal. Then after I'm done removing the stripper and the finish beneath it, I'll grab some mineral spirits and fine steel wool, specifically fine steel wool, like very fine or extra fine, whatever they call it, like the triple zero. And I'll go over that surface, which removes any leftover chemical stripper and usually gets rid of any paint or primer or anything that was left over that the stripper didn't work on. Once I have a nice surface, I'll wet a microfiber cloth and wipe off any residue from the mineral spirits and then leave the surface to dry thoroughly before going in with my next step, whether that's to then sand it to really get it looking fresh 
prime it for painting or just going in with wood conditioner to prep it for a stain. There's some common mistakes that I've done myself and heard of others doing while using chemical strippers, so I also wanted to highlight those in today's episode. The first is not using enough product. And listen, if you know me, you know I am cheap as fuck, so better believe I try to make any product that I invest in last as long as humanly possible. It's a blessing and a curse. But this was why initially I wasn't seeing the results that others were when using these chemical strippers. I was being too stingy and putting the thinnest layer possible over the surface and thinking the finish was just going to jump off the surface. To get the best results, it's important to apply a thick and even coat across the entirety of the surface. One way I make sure I have enough is once I have it all over the surface and everything is thoroughly covered, I'll go back with my foam brush or chip brush and kind of pat or bounce the brush across the surface to essentially create little peaks and to get any remaining product off of the brush and bunched up on the surface. This was a handy trick that I learned from Karen at Designs by Karen. Go check out her Instagram for some handy furniture flipping hacks if you aren't already following her. She's great and so sweet. Another issue that can arise if you leave the stripper on for too long, and yes, I am fully aware that I just said that I leave the stripper on for longer than the directions indicate, so take my advice with a grain of salt. But if you keep an eye on it and check on the stripper periodically, you should be good. You just don't want it to be on there so long that it begins to dry out, which then just makes it less effective. Once you see the finish begin to bubble and lift, and that's happening on the majority of the piece, you should be good to go to scrape it all away. And again, if you maybe need to leave it on even longer and can't monitor it during that time, that is a case when I would highly recommend utilizing the plastic wrap over it because I know some refinishers that will put stripper on and cover it with plastic wrap, and then leave it overnight to work its magic and it is still moist in the morning when they go into the workshop to get started on it the next day. Sorry for saying moist. And if you find that you've put the stripper on and it's been almost as long as the directions say to keep the product on and you aren't really seeing anything happening, I would recommend trying to apply more product and then letting it sit a while longer before trying to remove the finish. If it really isn't budging, don't be afraid to apply a second coat and let it sit and then try again. Sometimes you just get really stubborn finishes and that's just what they need. Don't take it personally and don't let it deter you from finishing the project. I have my moments and am stubborn sometimes too. It's all good. And something you may not know about me, I love little motivational messages. They get me fired up, so I keep a list of ones that are catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone, and I end every podcast episode with one that I've noted down over the years, so that you leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. So this week's Mel's motivational message is, big earners are big learners. I talk about this all the time on the podcast, the importance of that continued education, personal development, and just integrating learning into your day-to-day routine in whatever way makes most sense for you, whatever way you enjoy learning most. For me, I love listening to podcasts and taking in information that way while I'm able to be a little busy bee putzing around the house and doing chores and working on my furniture and all that stuff. But that's the only way I've ever had any success in this business is because I make a really concerted effort to be learning like every day even if it's a busy day and I don't have a lot of time and I'm running around the city and stuff I'm listening to podcasts while I'm driving and I'm making mental notes of things to write down or to action or to try and look up and all these things that are contributing in different ways to facets that come together for the different legs of my business over time Because I'm listening to these people who aren't even necessarily in the space that I'm in, but they are social media marketers, or maybe they're marketers in a more traditional sense, or maybe they run their own businesses doing something else. Maybe they're crafters, maybe they're thrifters, or they're just talking about sustainability and eco-friendly options. Like all of these worlds that are kind of around me, but aren't necessarily the world that I'm living in, in my business, in my day-to-day. I think we have things that we can learn from anybody if we dig deep enough or we look at things critically enough. And the big earners are the big learners. 
So find those ways that you can integrate that learning into your day-to-day. One podcast that I listen to all the time is The Mindset Mentor, and he always talks about this story, which is a true story of someone who was running a big fast food restaurant chain and was trying to make everything super efficient within this business and cut down on the time that a customer would have to wait for their food after they ordered and cut down the time it takes to put that order in and all these things. And he had gotten to the point where everything seemed as efficient as possible but he didn't take that to mean that he was the best and there was nothing to do. He then looked outside of his business and started looking at different sectors. And eventually he was talking to or shadowing someone at a bank and saw that they were putting in a drive through window for this bank machine and started asking questions of what's that about? And for them, it was so that people didn't have to get out of their vehicles and it was a more efficient way to offer those banking services. And a light bulb went off in this guy's head and he's like, I'm going to do that for my fast food restaurant. And that's how a drive through at a fast food restaurant, which you almost don't even see a restaurant without it these days was born. He was the first one to do it. And I don't remember names and I don't remember dates and I don't remember those kinds of logistics. But as I hear these stories, I take away the concepts and the learnings and the lessons that come from them. And that all comes together to either motivate me and work positively towards my mindset, or I'm literally taking like the ideas of what they've implemented into their business and thinking about the strategy and the way that I could mirror that in mine, or if there's bits and pieces that I could pull from it to make it make sense in my world. So I highly recommend you adopt a learning mindset. Big earners are big learners and we need to be constantly adapting and figuring these things out for ourselves because nobody's going to drop it in our lap. Nobody's going to sit us down and teach us these big important things. We have to go out there. We have to ask questions. We have to be curious so that we can learn and evolve. All right, that's it for now. I appreciate your time and I will catch you guys next week.